All righty. Well, I guess I'll get started now. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is John Lakos. I work at Bloomberg. Um, hopefully, if you haven't already seen it, you will go see it. The, the C++, uh, beating C++ talk that I gave in 2017 on local arena memory allocators was probably the best version of that talk that I've ever given or ever will give. Uh, it was fairly concise. It's two hours but it fully demonstrates why allocators give you great performance under certain circumstances. So this talk assumes that that's true. And this talk is about, is it worth it? And we need to examine because the fact is, is that to have, uh, to use allocators, there's some work involved. And so we're gonna try to take a fairly uh, uh, honest look at what the cost-benefit trade-off is for using allocators in large-scale C++. <clears throat> so this is the talk. Uh, this is the copyright notice. This is the abstract. You don't really need to read it because you're already here. For people who are watching it on video, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, the purpose of this talk, the current state of affairs, Local allocators provide performance. And again, uh, C++ now, I gave the talk, but meeting, meeting C++ was probably the best, so I would recommend that. Um, there are a lot of real world costs, and there are also some important collateral benefits. Uh, and yet, there are some concerns, and I put them in quotes because the concerns aren't really founded. So what we'd like to do today is to present uh, Allocator-aware software styles. They're different styles of achieving the same thing. Separate real from imagined costs. Discuss some important collateral benefits. And finally, talk about common concerns that people have about allocators. I think probably the, the worst thing that going for allocators is their bad rep. Um, there, there is some justification for that, but there's a lot of stuff that's said that simply isn't true. Um, then I'm going to advocate for using them today, but then I'm going to make an analogy and I'm going to suggest what if. So there's some what ifs. What if we could do this magic thing that doesn't exist today? So as you're watching this and if you're teetering on the edge, the point is to try to convince you without pulling out the magic, the magic that I'm going to pull out at the end because I want to try to convince you without the magic and then tell you the magic because then it should put it right over, I'm hoping. So we'll see what happens. Um, here's the outline and the introduction. Well, dynamic memory allocation is important. New delete is usually adequate, but custom allocation is sometimes advantageous and sometimes it's absolutely necessary. Would everybody agree that once in a while you have to go down to the metal and do what you need to do? That's why we write in C++, right? That's because we can do that sometimes, hopefully. But custom allocation is not for free. And I assume that you're here because you've at least thought about it or tried it or are thinking about trying it. And it does require effort. And it's error prone and so on and so forth. So what we're going to suggest is if you had an infrastructure that was allocator aware, and we'll see what I mean by that, uh, then you, as a user of this, could take advantage of it without having to do all of the heavy lifting yourselves. That, would be a good thing. But then who's going to write the allocator-aware software? So, <clears throat> and soon, this thing that I'm calling BB20V, which is Bloomberg's 2020 vision version of allocators, which I've been looking at since, I would say, uh, late 2017, uh, but now we're in the full throes of, is going to make a real difference in the cost-benefit analysis. So, Two approaches to custom memory allocation. You design it as needed yourself whenever. You just, you need a data structure, it needs to do a managed memory in this way, and you write it from scratch. And it gives you the best possible performance, obviously, because you're writing it for a specific purpose. However, there's a high development cost and there's a high maintenance cost. So if you think about it from the point of view of a large company where you have application developers who are trying to solve business problems and you have infrastructure developers who are focused on delivering prefabricated, hierarchically reusable solutions so that the application developers can pull them out of the box and use them, then uh, it, it's, it's certainly better to have that 
ready to go than to make the application developer write something complex that's heavily uh, intricate and involved and low level because that takes time away from actually solving business problems. So when you look at it from the customer's perspective, the, the application developer in this case, um, there's a very high development cost for writing your own custom data structures. Oh, and the alternative is, as I said, to have what we call allocator aware software and that means software that you can supply an existing allocator to and it takes advantage of that particular memory management style. Uh, it gives you nearly the best possible performance. Not fully the best, but nearly. And in some cases so close to the best that it's not worth worrying about at much lower cost to the application developer. Um, Plus, it gives the application developer some collateral benefits that we'll look at that you simply can't get from custom uh, uh, containers. So, probably one of the most important things I can explain to you is that, and it's, it, it took a while to refine this, but there's an airline analogy uh, that I want to go through, and it'll give you an idea of why allocators, if if, if presented properly, can, can really fill a void that we don't have today. So, think about first class. It's the best possible, economy is the cheapest possible, and this is from the client perspective, right? So there's two things, starting with that. And if you, you imagine that there, there's, there's, a, there's a single dividing line, you're either in economy or you're in first class. And you can imagine that people, who are in airlines have, can be sorted in terms of how much they want to be in first class, right? From I don't care at all to I absolutely must fly in first class. And there's some point at which they're willing to pay for it. Do you see what I'm saying? There's that point. So if I took everybody in this room and you say, I said pick a number between one and a hundred that represents your utility for being in first class, so suppose it's a floating point number. I could sort you, you know, and you'd, you'd line up and, and the people who wanted first class most would be at the front of the line, the people who could care less would be at the back of the line. And you can imagine that the people who need high performance uh, uh, as a result of, of memory allocation will also be able to line up in that same way. So the people that are willing to write their own data structures are in first class and the people who are not willing to write their own data structures are an economy. Do you see the analogy? I mean, it's like that. So there's that point right there and the dividing line. And we don't know exactly where it is. And this is an, a, a, a qualitative discussion of how you can think about the economy of writing your own allocator. Now, there's a cost. It's on the same uh, x-axis, but the y-axis is different because the benefits are different units than the cost. The cost is in development and maintenance time, and the benefits are in runtime performance and the, the ability to place objects in memory and the ability to monitor them and all kinds of things. So there's, they're, they're not the same things, but everything eventually ultimately translates to dollars, so you can imagine that the, the two could be mapped onto something, some single unit, but they're not. They're different units. Okay, so <clears throat> for the people who aren't willing to write their own, there's no cost at all to, to memory allocation because you don't have it. Then, for people who are willing to write their own, for each component, also called a module, for each module that you decide the stuff in here will be allocator aware, uh, there are, or, or will, be, will be custom memory management, there's a high cost because you're writing each one of those things from scratch. So there's this nice abrupt line. Now, that's the cost, and here's the benefit, right? The benefit is that you're getting that utility under your line. This is sort of straightforward economics, right? You, the line shows the added utility of getting what you want. So... <clears throat> Now I want to introduce the notion of business class and premium economy. And they're fighting against uh, first class and, and economy. Premium economy is a little bit more expensive, but you get a bigger seat, you get more legroom, whatever. So for a little bit more money, you get something nice. Business class is almost as good as first class. Uh, it's a, you know, it doesn't have all the ornate gold and, and whatever, but it's still it's a seat that lies down and you pretty much get everything that you would get in first class at business class at a fraction of the price. So what I'm introducing here is a point 
at which somebody who really didn't care about memory allocation at all, or, or memory management, where they would say, I don't care, I, I'm not interested even in that tiny little $29 fee. I don't want it. I don't, I don't want to get alcoholic drinks. I don't need the extra leg room. I'm done. I'm good. Just leave me alone. I will call that point where, where the other point was alpha, the point where we were deciding whether I'm going to go first class or coach, we'll call alpha minus the point where I'm not even willing to pay anything for memory allocation, we'll call that al alpha minus. Then there's a point where I am so abundantly wealthy or I need first class so badly that it doesn't matter how much it costs, I'm going to do it anyway. No matter how cheap you make business class, I'm still going, I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm going first class. I want it all. And we'll call that alpha plus. And that generates a range between economy and first class. And that's this cabin. And I'm just going to call that upper class. And that's corresponding to the use of allocator aware software, which you pretty much pay premium economy prices for and get business class service. So that's the analogy. That's the pitch. And the fact that there's Two, we'll just say that the, the cabin was redone and they're all business class seats, but you're paying premium economy, even though this is what it would look like on the plane. Okay, so now we have this cost function, and this is how much I pay if I don't spend any money at all. I don't even want to know that this thing is allocator aware. Okay, I want to use it, it's allocator aware, but I wouldn't have written my own. Okay, I would have written my own, but since I have it, I'm going to use it, and I'm not going to spend all that money. Great. And I don't care. I'm writing my own because I need the highest possible performance, and I don't want to even worry about what you're doing. Now, these, this is not exact numbers, but you can see that there are these, these four regions. And the people who write their own are going to get the benefit just as before. But the people who would have written their own are still getting the benefit that they need. Uh, they're just not paying for it. Then we get this actual increased benefit of people that wanted it but couldn't afford it, but now they can have it for almost free. Almost. And again, I'm talking about the people who are using it, not the infrastructure group that has to plumb it. That's where the real cost is buried. But for the users, it's really nice. And so here we have this added benefit. So this is a good thing. Now, there's this, this cost saving, and that's what we don't have to pay where we would have paid it before. So if you're interested in cost savings, there's your cost savings, and the green is your added benefit. This is incremental cost savings. The people who, they don't have to write all of this custom data structure because they can get what they need by just putting a couple of pieces together. Now, you'll notice that there's this, this point here. There's also this point here. And what do you think they mean? Well, they mean nothing because they're different axes and so they just happen to exist. Please ignore them and pay attention to the vertical lines that correspond to the different regions on the curve. And that is, I don't care. I care enough that if you give it to me for almost nothing, I'll take it. Really thanking you because I would have done it myself and I'm doing it myself anyway. So those are the four regions. Does that make sense? Okay. This analogy is super important to me. <clears throat> now, which airline do you think I fly? Okay, and I use an American Advantage card, AA. Consider this an AA meeting. <laughs> Allocator aware, that's what you need to remember. So originally in the paper that I was writing, the diagram looked like this. If I had shown you this to begin with, you would have said, what? What is that? But that's actually the original drawing. But it helps to unpack it, doesn't it? Okay, good. Discussion? That's actually the important part, by the way. If you left now, you'd have about half the talk. And we're only 15 minutes into it, seriously. Because that's the important part. What we're trying to do is price discrimination. We're trying to, to create a new market, a market for people that otherwise don't know about allocators, don't care about allocators, and then they're the people that don't care about them either be at the other end because they're writing their own. And there are many people out there that think that there are only two classes, economy and first class. And I wish to disabuse you of that. There is a business class for economy or for premium economy prices. It does exist for clients. Okay. So this part I'm going to run through quickly. Um, 
C++11, C++17, and Magic are the three different models. C++11, and I'm ignoring the C++03 and 98 models because they can't be called models because they didn't work. So we just ignore them. So in 11, we had something that worked. In 17, we have something that was usable, although it's not easy yet to, to make it happen. And then we have the magic. So those are the three models. And <clears throat> there are four interface styles. BDE is the Bloomberg Development Environments version. Um, and, and it's something that we've been doing at Bloomberg forever. And before that, I was doing it at Bear Stearns. Uh, since 1997. So we have a tremendous amount of experience with the BDE model, um, which is almost the same as the C++17 model. So those two are essentially, really, they have the same principle. PMR stands for polymorphic memory resource or polymorphic memory allocators. And all that means is that the type doesn't uh, invade the type of the container. So you can have different allocators for the same type of vector of int, for example. That's what makes PMR so special. C++11 is the fastest possible. There's no overhead, nothing. It can do anything. And if you don't use it, it doesn't do you any good. So it was just unfortunate intermediate step. All right. So C++11, here are the pros. It's uh, zero overhead in the literal sense, because there's nothing there. Uh, and it lets you do anything you could possibly want to do, including have allocators into shared memory. The cons, unfortunately, are there's no way to get a handle to the allocator. There's no way to use it conveniently. Clients who need to be able to work with allocators themselves have to be templates, in a nutshell. It's not an effective model, because it's too compile time coupled, and it's too complex. Um, so the BD style and the PMR style, it's runtime centric. Um, the pros are clients don't need to be uh, templated. It's much more interoperable. Uh, it has reduced implementation costs, and it can be automated, a lot of it. So that's nice. The cons are it's not literally zero runtime and spatial overhead, although practically it is. And we, can, we'll, we will talk about that. And as ever, there are significant implementation and maintenance costs if you do it by hand. And again, the PMR style is the same. Small syntactic differences. It's not worth talking about the differences. You get the idea. They're, they're basically the same thing. The last one, which is magic that we were just alluding to, uh, is something where we, we don't have to do the plumbing ourselves. In other words, we're going to ask the compiler, uh, please make this thing that I wrote allocator aware. How are we going to do that? That's not this talk. Because that's a research project that's underway right now. It's been underway for a while. Uh, we really do expect to have results in a matter of less than two years, hopefully 18 months. And by results, I mean something that runs in a compiler that you can actually play with. That's the goal. I, you know, this is research. We can't, we don't know. But uh, we're on it. Um, so that means pretty much all of the coding that you would be doing to make in infrastructure to make soft, the, the allocators, uh, the, the containers allocator aware would be done for you. Now remember as a client, it's not much different because you just get to use it out of the box. It's just that instead of having to do all of that work and maintenance and whatever that existed before, uh, that infrastructure group would have a lot of its load removed. The other thing is, is it because if it's part of the language, things that we can't do now would automatically become available. So that's a good thing. Um, compiler generated uh, uh, constructors, for example, would automatically become allocator aware. So you wouldn't have to write, would be the rule of, oh, if I want an allocator aware, I have to write all six things or all four things or whatever I'm doing. I could just, uh, I could just let the compiler do it completely and it would work. That's the goal. All right. Um, the way this would happen then again is instead of injecting the allocator into the uh, object of construction through the argument signature, it would do it in some sort of general external way. And as a hint, I might say, construct this object using this allocator. As a hint, it's possible. We don't know exactly what the syntax would be, but that's a thought. And so if that's all you had to do, and otherwise classes would look just as if allocators didn't exist, that's a huge win for usability. But again, 
I mean, if you had to, if you had to write virtual functions uh, by passing in the V table, that would kind of be horrible. But you don't have to do that. You just declare a function virtual and the compiler takes care of it. It's that kind of thing. Another one is if you're building up a struct of structs that are already following the rule of six, you get the rule of six for free. It's that kind of idea. It just builds up. It just composes. We'll see. Anyway, that's the future. We're back to the present. Allocators require work. So no matter what allocator style we use, pretty much, except C++11 is, is pretty horrible, uh, we get the same performance uh, benefits and it's much better to have allocator-aware software than not have allocator-aware software when you're a client because otherwise you have to either do without or write it yourself. Discussions on that. You understand that basically there's PMR and there's magic because C++11 isn't good enough. Make sense? Okay. Moving along. So performance benefits... I'll just briefly reprise some of the cases where the performance is really important. Allocator performance comes in when your program size exceeds certain thresholds, like L1 cache and the uh, working set size of your computer. If you, if you can't fit your program in the number of, of physical pages you have, then you need allocators, pretty much. Okay? And having locality buys you stuff also at the cache line level. If you can keep something within your cache lines in L1 cache, that's enormous. If it expands so that it doesn't fit in L1 cache through diffusion, what do I mean by diffusion? I should probably just quickly. There's this term called fragmentation and there's this term called diffusion. They are not the same thing. Fragmentation, you might have enough memory in your system to allocate a, a contiguous block, but because the memory isn't contiguous that you want to allocate, you can't do it and so you fail. Diffusion is different. Diffusion is saying I have a lot of little things and I could either have them clustered in a few pages in memory or I have them spread out all over physical memory, all over virtual memory, in fact. And if I spread them out all throughout all virtual memory, I might not be able to get all of my working set into my physical memory and that causes order of magnitude uh, degradation in performance. And this can happen when you use a global allocator instead of a local allocator. Doesn't matter what global allocator you use because what's happening is you allocate here, you put it there, you allocate here, da, 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 and then eventually what used to be uh, a nice tight originally allocated uh, 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 subsystem becomes diffused throughout all of your virtual memory and now you, each page is not densely packed with what you need and so you can't fit them all in. Does that make sense? That applies for cache lines and that applies for pages. So at two ends of the spectrum, there's some real benefit to having that locality and that's what local allocators give you. So with that said, um, there are two, two things that allocators can, can give you. They can allocate and deallocate faster if you know what's going on, but that's not the most important. The much more important one is locality. Locality dominates it turns out that when you're, when you're getting memory, uh, using it and getting rid of it in a single function, having a, a non-synchronizing allocator that works off the program stack has been demonstrated to give four to six times uh, X, not percent, six times performance benefits. We've been doing this for a while. There are people that will not give up their stack allocators for anything because the clients would complain. We have a certain amount of time. When you hit a button, you want to get a response within some number of milliseconds. And if we didn't have allocators, we simply would not be able to do that without writing things custom, which, again, is expensive and so on and so forth. So just want to say there are people that we know, anecdotally, we know are convinced, and the goal is to spread the convincing. Of course, they're users. They're not implementers. So... That's fine. Uh, so short running programs, the ones I just described, long running programs over time, memory diffuses. So if you don't have nice barriers for your, or your subsystems, the memory will diffuse out and then eventually it will slow down. Um, so a common usage pattern, the one I said, build it up, use it, get rid of it, and we use a monotonic allocator for that. Second usage pattern is we're constantly getting and putting uniform blocks of memory, and we use a multi-pool allocator for that. And the, another usage pattern is we may need to destroy a whole bunch of objects en masse, 
and every local allocator is a managed allocator. Managed allocator is something that not only has an allocate and a deallocate, but it also has a release. And that says, everything I allocated, give it back. And that's an extremely efficient way of releasing memory in a particular arena. And is it dangerous? Absolutely. But if it's what you want to do, then C++ lets you do it because we're all adults here and we know what we're doing, hopefully. <sighs> all right. So I was talking about multiple levels of hardware. I, I think we pretty much covered this. I'll just put it up so people can see it. Um, but again, locality is the one that wins as far as the big, big improvement. You get a constant, solid improvement for build it up, use it, tear it down. But when it comes to long running programs and having your hot spots localized so that when you're, when you're beating on some physically local thing for a while, as long as that's all very tight in a few pages, you're going to win really large compared to if you don't. If you don't believe me, please go look at Benchmark 2 from C++, meeting C++ 2017 local uh, arena memory allocators, because that will prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's no question. It's, it, there's a, all heat maps, and it's a beautiful thing. So go look at that. Um, so again, uh, the, the nice thing about local arena allocators is that they reduce, they don't eliminate, but they reduce diffusion. Okay. Threading is another thing. Um, it, there are global allocators that, that look to give, uh, uh, take advantage of threading and making sure that things are, are local uh, to a thread, and that's different from thread local storage, but just local. And uh, it becomes very difficult when you have things like time multiplexing coupled with threading. And so having the ability to specifically articulate that this is the available memory that's local to the memory that's in use so that the two are together and treated together as a unit, like in use, not in use, but physically local, is something that allocators do very nicely. Um, so there's another thing. Uh, there's something called um, uh, fault sharing which happens when you have uh, uh, two different threads trying to access objects that happen to be unrelated but are on the same cache line. Allocators both eliminate the false sharing and encourage true sharing, meaning they are part of the same working set and when you get asked for one, the other one comes in for free. So allocators do exactly what you want them to do in that context. Um, you need to have global knowledge. So if you just think about it, global allocators don't have global knowledge, but people who are designing systems do. Uh, they need to understand the different characteristics of the allocators. You can't write this stuff well unless you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, let a really good global allocator take care of it. If you sort of know what you're doing, use a general purpose local allocator to help you. And if you really know what you're doing, use a special purpose local allocator that if you misuse it will hurt you but will really give you the top performance and then to top it off you can do some magic like winking out the memory instead of deleting it and destroying it individually. So you have levels of expertise that you can go to but there's almost no limit to the performance benefits you can get. And I, I mean getting as close to the maximum performance not infinite performance because that's silly. Questions? So I hope you understand that I'm not trying to convince you that memory allocators give you good performance because that was the 2017 talk. And there's plenty of anecdotal evidence. There's plenty of real evidence. And I've even commissioned, am going to commission, a study to demonstrate the value of allocators in industry by someone will, will wait until the study comes out. But hopefully this will be a very reputable academic paper that will just simply put to rest any question of the value of local arena memory allocators. That's the goal, to be continued. All right, <clears throat> costs. So we need to be realistic about costs. There are costs associated with developing allocator-aware software. And that is probably why we don't have it 
You have to be a big company to want to have an, an infrastructure group that develops allocator-aware infrastructure. It increases the amount of work that the infrastructure group has to do, and the more complex the data structure, the more intricate it, it can be. So there's two different kinds of costs are the upfront costs of creating and maintaining it, and then, and that includes the plumbing. So for example, if I have a, an object or a type, and the type has subtypes, when I construct the object and I pass in an allocator, I have to propagate that allocator to the constructors of the sub-objects. Now, it's not hard to do that. In fact, it's, it's, it's dead simple, and it can even be automated. But you have to do it, and if you get it wrong, you have a bug. Imagine trying to place an object in some particular part of memory, and most of the object went there, but not all of it. Then you wrote it out to disk, then you read it back in, and you have most of your object, but not all of it. That's a horrible bug. But fortunately, we have tools that tell you you did it wrong, and we even have tools that write it for you, so it's a little bit better than that. But this effort is mostly borne by the infrastructure groups, not the clients. The clients are living very happily. True story, I proposed this to one of the clients and said we're thinking about uh, possibly having the compiler do this for us. And the person who's very, very senior person said, oh, you don't need to do that. We're fine with it the way it is. Yeah, you're fine, but we actually have to do it. So the point is that the, while it will be better for the client that the compiler does it because it'll be fully interoperable with all of C++ 2X, um, that's not really as important as that the people in the infrastructure group will be relieved of having to worry about it pretty much at all. So that's an awesome thing. Anyway, that said. The incremental cost is literally the cost of ignoring the extra parameters and the extra documentation associated with having allocator-aware software. So you will see things that are, when you're using allocator-aware software and you don't need it, you'll say, well, hmm, What does that mean, you know? And so, if you don't care, you shouldn't have to look at it. Anyway, the cost of, of doing this uh, plumbing for, for most classes is relatively straightforward, although it's still a lot of boilerplate. And the classic example is if you had a struct that had two strings, it would just work without allocator awareness. But if you have to plumb that, now you can't just have a struct with two strings in it, you have to create a class and put and write it yourself. You have to actually implement this thing. It would be wonderful if the compiler just did that for you, but it doesn't. So what would have been a few lines of code becomes a lot of boilerplate. And that's where we understand that this should be a language feature because the compiler can do that perfectly every time without making you do anything. So again, great argument for its being a language feature. Um, all you have to do though is basically when you have a constructor, you just forward that, that uh, trailing allocator argument to all of its sub-objects, and you're pretty much done for basic objects. Um, you might have to denote the type as being allocator aware with a trait. That's not too onerous. Um, Non-typical classes become increasingly more challenging, generic template uh, container types, and so on. Um, so things like, like STD complex, now, you know, it gets a little bit worse. Now we have a, a vector. Now a vector is, has the notion of, of allocating something that's outside of its just its constructor. So pushback allocates. What do we need to do there? It's a little more complicated. And it may require some additional direction. Again, this is all to be determined, but you don't typically write vector-like classes. That's atypical. For people who write typical stuff, it's still pretty straightforward. But then there are things like STD pair. And STD pair doesn't have anything to do with allocators, and yet if it's a pair of things that are allocating, what up? And we know from experience in the standards committee that this is a big pain. And this is the kind of thing where if the compiler were involved, it would be a piece of cake. All right. Shared pointer is its own research project. I admit it. I would never, like, put that on the compiler. I would just do that one special. Um, but they get increasingly more complex. Um, so how much more source code? We measured in 2017, roughly, I think, uh, uh, between 4 and 17%. So I'm just going to say 10% is the back of the envelope. You have to write 10% more code if you want allocator-aware software. That's not nothing. That's 10%. It's an easy 10% compared to the rest of the stuff. It's boilerplate, but it's 10% more code. 
And then there's, of course, training. And training includes not just how to write it, but how to test it and how not to screw it up. And, of course, uh, whenever you're doing this, all this work, you're not doing real business work, so there's an opportunity cost. Uh, there might be other projects that could be done, but no, you're writing allocator aware software. So we have to be fair. Yes, there's a cost to it, and that's it. The mitigating factors are that it lends itself to automation very well, and we have preprocessors that can go through and take a class that is not allocator aware and make it allocator aware without your having to write it. But again, it's not fully complete. It's much harder to write a preprocessor than it is to uh, write a compiler because the compiler can actually see the points of instantiation and, and has direct access as opposed to trying to write metaprogramming into the type that is being preprocessed so that it can try to deal with, well, what if it is, what if it isn't, and so on and so forth. It's much easier to do when you have the actual compiler doing the work. Um, and again, the magic would do most of the work. So think about it this way. If, if we're going to try to create a compiler that does this work for us, it is a huge single upfront cost. We have to develop the technology. And if you think about self-driving cars, right? Self-driving cars has a huge upfront cost to develop the technology. But once the technology is developed, the cost of an individual self-driving car versus an individual not self-driving car is not substantially more because really there are a few extra sensors, but the software that had to come into existence to make it work, that technology is already in existence and so we know that, if that makes sense. So, so having 10,000 more self-driving cars or 10,000 more not self-driving cars, cost is comparable. And the same, that's the idea here, is that once we get the technology, having 10,000 more uh, allocator aware components versus not allocator aware components, the cost is roughly the same. Make sense? At least that's the idea. You see where we're headed. This would be a nice thing if it can happen. If you're skeptical that we can make it happen, that's fair. We haven't done it yet, but stay tuned. Um, the cost of using AASI is comparatively small. It's much faster and easier than doing it yourself. Uh, all you have to do is supply an allocator at construction. Um, it does require, of course, additional testing, but it certainly requires less testing to connect two pieces together, like having components of a stereo, than to design the stereo components yourself. That requires more testing, clearly. Uh, if you have no need for custom uh, memory allocation, then you can just ignore the allocator wear parameters. You don't need to test it differently, and just the entire thing is opt-in. So while it is a little bit harder to not use allocators in allocator aware software than it is to not use them in not allocator aware software today, it's not that much harder. You have to ignore a couple of things. You'll see some stuff. Uh, like a larger interface, you'll have more constructors. Uh, you'll see that there's a trailing uh, argument. You'll see that there's an English contract, and it'll say something like optionally specify a basic allocator to supply blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, it's clearly a benefit for people who are going to use it. It's not so clear for people who aren't going to use it. And then there's the idea that you, where do you, if you know that your clients aren't going to be using it, do you really propagate the allocator awareness just because? Where do you stop? And then there's a whole discussion of, you know, is it worth it? And, and this is, these are all fair questions. Um, then there's opportunities for misuse. It's entirely possible that somebody will come along and stupidly put an allocator that doesn't give back memory uh, someplace. The, the, the case that's much rarer than that is the case where you, you hand out um, uh, an object from a function where the allocator was on the program stack, let's say, and then you pass the object back somehow, and that object uh, is no longer resident in... Uh, the, the allocator is no longer alive, but the, but the object is. It's hard to do that because typically the way you do such a thing, it's called the scoped allocator model. You create an allocator on the stack, you create an object and pass the address of the allocator in. Because it's in that order, in the same scope, the allocator will naturally outlive the object that it's, it's, it's funding with memory. You have to go out of your way to separate the two. And that's just bad practice and a bad idiom. And you don't do that. And you don't have dangling pointers 
we know how to do this. This is, this, you know, you just follow certain reasonable practices and life is good. But what people will do is they'll take something like a managed allocator and they'll put it outside a loop and then they'll loop and do something over and over, never giving back the memory, even though it looks like it because they're constructing and destroying and constructing and destroying. And then you run out of virtual memory and your program crashes. And this does happen. So misusing a special purpose allocator is, is a very common way to have a bug. And so people must be trained not to do that. Um, the other thing is, it might be that people are using allocators in a way that does you absolutely no good. And so if they're using allocators and it's doing absolutely no good, that is a cost because it's wasting people's time and effort to look at it when it's not actually doing anybody any good. So here's another problem. It's not a cost, but right now library-based allocator awareness doesn't uh, play well with a number of modern features. Um, if, if you uh, have some sort of uh, non-trivial constructor, the, the compiler's generating, it's the compiler isn't going to generate this for you today, so you have to write it yourself. That's unfortunate. Um, and there, there are all kinds of uh, uh, other things, uh, initializations and aggregates and this, that, that allocators just don't work with today, lambdas for example. So we would have to do some additional work in the standard to make sure that every feature that C++ supports works seamlessly with whatever allocator it was imbued with at construction. That's not a problem as long as you have a mechanism for doing it that's independent of the typical parameters. Then we're fine. And so we don't, we're not worried about making that happen. We think we can do that in virtually every case. Um, okay. Now, the assertion that allocators do not interact with modern C++ move semantics is false. It is, it is one of those things that is said, sounds like a good idea, it's totally wrong, and having just finished this book I've been working on for a long time, which will be out in December, um, I had a chance to go back and really investigate move and, 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 and when it's needed without a copy and so on and so forth. And, and, and this is just simply not true. Um, move works perfectly well with allocators when it's in the same arena. If it's a global allocator, sure, it works all the time. And if a move doesn't work, it can fall back to a copy. There are very few cases, and this is a separate talk, where you want to move something, but you don't want to copy it. And this is something for you to think about. When would you want to move something when it's not copyable? And there are a few cases, certainly, and unique pointers an example. But bottom line is, if you're moving something, it better be in the same arena, otherwise you're causing the same diffusion, potentially, uh, if you're going from dynamically allocated memory to dynamically allocated memory, you're, you're moving something to a different subsystem logically, but not physically. That is causing a hole, and now when you're focused on that system, you're making long leaps to other pages because it's moved and not copied. So think about it. Move is actually works perfectly well with allocators within a container, perfect, absolutely perfect for vectors, perfect for, for inserting and doing that kind of thing. But just keep in mind that move is not uh, uh, a problem with uh, um, using with allocators because you use it where it's appropriate like you do anything else. And there's much more to this story. Um, so lifetime management issues is certainly something that um, can happen. Um, we just need to, to let people know not to do that, but I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, and just generally, there, 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 are, there are some minor, I'm going to say, uh, caveats. You don't want to do things that interfere with the true benefits of allocators when you want to use them. So again, if you're using allocators, you do things a certain way because they work that way. Um, but anyway, so I will... It's certainly there's more effort, education tools and governance. Um, there's administrative costs. Uh, all, all the things you'd expect, you have to train reviewers. There's, there's a whole infrastructure, a, a cottage industry of getting people to understand things. If you think about how hard it is to get people to write exception 
safe code. That's a non-trivial change from people who didn't write exception safe code. And yet, many people feel that's a better way to write code. I being one of them, even though we don't catch or throw or try in, in our code, we are still exception agnostic. We make sure we write code such that if somebody injected an exception in our code, it would work because we just think it's sloppy not to let that work even though we don't do it. So it's good quality software. Um, anyway, there, there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of training that goes on. There's a lot of overhead and we just accept that and say yes because we think the value far exceeds that cost, just like testing is expensive, but the value exceeds the cost of testing because the cost of not testing is so incredibly expensive. Um, anyway, if somebody's going to do multi-threading, unit testing, anything about C++, there's a huge investment. And so, like any power tool, you need some training. No question about it. Bottom line, there's a real, real substantial cost. Um, especially for developing it. The incremental cost is not quite as bad, but uh, there's still a credible value proposition, even with the cost. And um, if we don't provide the infrastructure in the hierarchically reusable infrastructure, the ability to use allocators, then people will have to do it themselves. So by not spending the money in that place, we will spend it elsewhere and less efficiently. And that's my claim. But it's not a slam dunk. It's certainly something that people could disagree with. Does that make sense? So you, you understand, I'm, say, I'm not saying that allocators are without cost. They're pretty much without cost to the application developers, but they are of substantial cost to the infrastructure developers. But if you're one company supplying both, I think it's a net win. If you're the standards committee, it's definitely a win because nobody could do anything if the standards committee didn't make software allocator aware. Fortunately, they have, and that's what STD-PMR is. So we're good there. One small change. Everybody has to go out and stop using STD, and they have to start using STD-PMR. Small change. But, but no, seriously, the ecosystem needs to change to use PMR because that is the interoperable version of STD. So if you don't care about allocators, Still use STD PMR so that you can interoperate with the people that do in the interface. If you're in the implementation and you're doing something for yourself, it doesn't matter. But as an as a, as a interoperability unit of currency, PMR should be the standard moving forward, I claim. And that's what I think Bloomberg's going to do. All right, questions. So one of the questions was, uh, what percentage of the code benefits from allocators? I don't know. But the goal is to make that percentage larger by making it cheaper to try. I don't think it will necessarily ever cross 50%. But the most important code is what I'm targeting. The, you know, the, 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 even the top 10% would be awesome. Because, you know, the 80-20 the rule, you, you opt, you know, if you optimize the 20% of the code that does 80% of the work, or whether it's 90-10, or 99-1, or whatever, that's the idea. Uh, okay. Any, anything more on that? So, the next thing I could talk about is collateral benefits. We've already talked about performance. What else does having allocators do for you? And, um, all right, so, Rapid prototyping, modularity, hierarchical reuse, testing, instrumentation, and object placement, to name a few. So, uh, if you really need the highest performance thing, you're probably not going to get any collateral benefits. You're probably going to get exactly what you designed and no more. So, it's kind of interesting, my analogy here, when I go business class internationally, I sit in the front row, I'm right near the exit, so if the plane catches on fire, I'm the first one out, and the people in first class who are in front of me, you know, so they have to come back through the plane to get to the exit, but I'm right there. And that analogy is like rapid prototyping. If you think you need a data structure, you can just put it together and try it right off the bat. 
And so it's low cost, low risk, and you just select an algorithm, plug it in, try it, measure, tune it, repeat as needed, and deploy it immediately if it works. The alternative would require positing that this data structure might work, developing it, plugging it in, and then maybe discovering that it didn't work. Then what do you do? Do you go tell your boss, I just spent a month working on this thing, it didn't help, or do you leave it in and say, it's better, it's better, trust me. No, this is, this is a bad thing. When you could just quickly try three, four, five different data structures, find the right one, ship it today, then put in a, a ticket and say, all right, we're gonna schedule doing this perfectly and get the last little bit of percentage because that's the business decision you made, or not, and just leave it. And most of the time, just leave it is the right answer. Okay, chainability. The idea that you can take an allocator and, and put it with another allocator is an important property of, of, of these, these allocators. So I can have, for example, uh, a small block allocator can fall back on a large block allocator. And so I can have a big slab of memory and then I can have one that dices it up in a particular way. And that's super efficient. There are places where that really makes sense. You can also insert some sort of metric. You can put a counting allocator inside the chain so I can measure what's going on. And that's just snapping things together like Lego blocks. Very, very easy. If you're a user, it's nothing more than I'm going to create an allocator, then I'm going to create a counting allocator, then I'm going to put that feeding the, the pooling allocator, and the pooling allocator is going to feed the data structure that say it's an array of array of strings or whatever the heck you've got. And that's it. It's just five lines of code, three lines of code, whatever it is that you need compared to having to actually write something. So we're talking about pluggable, componentized systems this is really good stuff. Um, the test allocator is something that you can go on um, uh, YouTube and look at it. Uh, Attila is proposing it for the standard. We've had it for over 20 years, and it's the closest thing to a silver bullet you can imagine for testing things at scale, because you can test individual subsystems. You're not, you're not looking at something statically, you're looking at this particular thing. You can measure what's going on, and if there's a leak, it will tell you exactly where we have different kinds of, of, of um, where we get memory from, and so uh, a test allocator can be used in lieu of whatever allocator was for that particular purpose, and it'll tell you exactly what you want to know. So again, test allocators are amazing. They do all kinds of good stuff. They, uh, they, they match all, uh, allocations and deallocations, detect leaks. They can help you very nicely detect uh, when you have something that isn't exception safe systematically. That's just built in. Um, just, I, it just goes on. Test allocators are, you know, the best thing said sliced bread. So you really want to have them. But if you don't have uh, allocator aware software, you can't use a test allocator. Um, and there's... This is a more detailed one, but once you have a vocabulary type that's an allocator, you can pass in things that derive from other services like, like uh, um, uh, monitors. So I could have an object that is both an allocator and a monitor, and I could have a subsystem that knows to ask the allocator interface, by chance do you also derive from this other thing? And if it doesn't, that's fine. But if it does, it can actually export information by doing a dynamic cast. And in the second volume of the book that I just finished and is going to be out in December, there's a, there's a section called Use RTTI Only When You Don't Need It. And this is an example of using RTTI when you don't need it because it's optional, but if it's there, you can do something. And here's a way, it's like a Trojan horse that allows you to deliver kind of if you see what I'm saying, you can deliver other things that can play through this common vocabulary type, which is the allocator resource, so, or, or the memory resource. So I'll just put this up. This is a, I, I pretty much described um, what this is, and I'm a little low on time, so I'll just put it up so you can see it. Anyway, another one is placing in memory. In fact, when I, when I joined Bloomberg, being able to put something in, in uh, uh, memory mapped I.O., is, is very, very useful. Uh, and see, if you use placement new, you can't place a vector because the vector has secondary memory and the placement new places only the footprint. But if you use allocators, you can put the entire vector in a particular memory. And there's all kinds of, of places where you can put it. There it can be high bandwidth, 
bandwidth memory or write protected memory so you can actually allocate memory to something and then turn on write protection. And if somebody tries to write to it, it core dumps. This is a great way when you have a whole bunch of people, sort of a free for all, you can actually say, no, you made the mistake because the core dumps as soon as they try to do the bad thing they shouldn't have done. So there are lots of good reasons for wanting to have memory allocators that go beyond performance. Um, Again, we use the gmalloc allocator at Bloomberg because we originally, our original design from way back when is when we want to page something out, we actually put the object in memory map in mapped region and then we write it to disk and because we have multiple processes that are all identical, we can read it into another process bitwise. It's extremely fast. It works. What can I say? And, and it's done very well for us. And we use polymorphic memory allocators to make that happen. We've been doing that since 2001 or two or something like that. Maybe 2002. All right. When you really need to get down to, to the, the metal, this is, this is a good thing to use. Uh, traditional, like, if you, you can actually use um, allocators as part of your architecture. If you're, for example, instead of using a bunch of smart pointers, you can use raw pointers, build up a data structure, and you don't have to worry about uh, whether there are cycles or, or any of that stuff. You can simply wink out the entire data structure using raw pointers. So this can be used as a design as well as an optimization, and you simply just release it, and it all goes away in one shot. This is much, much faster and safer than doing it the other way. So, um, anyway. Um, there are many other things we could talk about, but given that I have only an hour, um, I will move it along. Um, one thing is, is that, that polymorphic memory allocators allow you to supply allocators at runtime that would other be, otherwise be bound to compile time. That's not the important part. It's the flexibility of not having the type of the allocator bound into the object. That's the critical point. That you can specify an allocator at runtime is great. We don't find that it's needed typically, but it happens to exist. It's, it's a, it's a, it comes along for free, so we'll take it. All right. Um, let's see. I have, uh, what, about 10 minutes left? All right. So let me at least do this uh, concerns. Uh, I'm going to attenuate the concerns part. I'm at least touch on them. Um, C++ 98 allocators didn't work. 03 allocators had weasel words. 11 is a pain in the you know what. And 17 are much better, but we still have costs associated with plumbing them. Um, there are other reasons that people give for why they don't like uh, allocators. And one of the most common ones is state-of-the-art allocators are as good or better. I hope it's obviously false. And it's very easy to prove this. All you need to do is take the person who wrote that awesome allocator and put that person in front of the constructor of the object you're about to create and tell that person, take that awesome allocator you wrote and strip it down to the bare minimum of what this specific object needs and use this local pool. Now tell me you can't do better. And of course, every person who's ever written a global allocator will say, well, of course, if you do that. So that, that argument is completely flawed. There is no such thing as, because we start with the best global allocator we have. That's the starting point. Now imagine if you're doing allocation directly off the program stack. You never call a global allocator. There's no global allocator involved, so it doesn't matter how fast it is if you never go there. If you simply take the memory right off the stack, use it and forget about it, there's nothing faster than that, and it's not even synchronized. We know we get four to six times performance improvements, so that's nonsense. Um, that PMR violates the zero overhead principle. In theory, that's true. So one of the things that's, that's commonly believed and is false is if you have a vector that has a footprint of three pointers, which typically is how people think of a vector as having uh, a pointer to the data that it's allocated, uh, a, a, a pointer to the end of the, of the used data portion, and a pointer to the end, one past the end, of the, of the, of, of the memory that's available, you have three pointers. But if you added allocators, there would be no implication whatsoever that you would have to have a fourth uh, pointer in the footprint. You could easily alias it to something else, like the capacity one, if the 
first pointer is null. So you can do things that don't cause an increased size in an empty vector footprint. You can always store the allocator pointer in the allocated memory as we do with malloc or other kinds of memory allocation and it's not noticeable. So when people say that there's overhead, in theory, but you can't really measure it. So is it really there? I don't know. The other one is people get very concerned about the idea that I have to make a virtual function call. Now, in the one case where that would be observable, turns out is when you're building up a data structure, using and getting rid of it, you will have an allocator. The allocator will be a concrete allocator and it will have an inline virtual function and then the thing that you're creating is typically a template container and the client compiler will see both the inline virtual function and the templated container and can de-virtualize the code very easily. And we've, it's, uh, GCC has been doing that since 2015. So we're not worried about that. And anyway, the advantage you get from having allocated it quickly uh, is what's really the big important point. So. Um, it's really just a, a, a runtime performance trade-off. It's not really, um, you know, yes, some, some, it's possible that something might be ever so slightly slower where you don't care, but it's, it's so much faster where you do that it's hard to imagine. For people who don't care, they would never notice, not un even if they tried. And for people who do care, it's phenomenally faster. So, again, I just... It's hard for me to understand that argument. Um, verification and testing complexity, uh, it's not that bad. It's not unmanageable. It's, it's, it's comparable to testing. Gross incompatibility with modern C++ style is really false. Uh, one, of the, one of the big arguments is, um, a, 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 is that we can, we can do things, we can do things, um, uh, uh, we, we can't return functions, for example, we can't return objects that are allocating by value because allocators don't work well in that, in that venue. And then people provide arguments like we can use object pools and whatever. Well, I don't have time to go through all of this here, but I'm putting this out because um, these are the common concerns. And since I can't go through them in detail, I do want to just say this. Whenever you return an allocating object by value, whether or not you provide allocator awareness, you are constructing and destroying that object. There's no choice. You are doing that. So an object pool isn't going to help you because the object, you're going to construct the object and destroy it. Object pools help you avoid constructing and destroying objects. So there is a... There is a, a, a discontinuity there. The other one is when you have a factory function and you want to return an object by value, you don't need it to move. You just need to construct it in place and once it's there, it doesn't need to move. So again, there's a lot of bad information out there and if you want to see something in more detail, I would suggest the go to the um, C++ Now talk where I talk about all of this. Because I have to skip over this. This is all the detailed discussions. And I'm going to go through it quickly here so I can get to the end. Um, but the idea is, sure, everybody pays a tiny tax for having to deal with allocators. But when you need them, you're good. Okay. Uh, again, I'm going to go through this quickly so people can I just want to put it on for people to look at in the video and uh, yeah as I said the reason I'm not too concerned about saying all this stuff is it's not true <laughs> it's just these are concerns but they're not concerns that actually have merit so I told you what is and unfortunately I don't have time to tell you what isn't but Okay, so the conclusion is their performance in, in instrumentation, object placement are all a bunch of good reasons for having it. Uh, before we had bespoke data structures or nothing and there's something in between. I admit that there are real engineering costs uh, for the software engineering, uh, uh, the, the, the software infrastructure group that they have to bear but I think it's honestly uh, a good trade-off. And having said all that, uh, I'm just going to put this up there because I don't want to go over. 
This would have been the conclusion, but I just want to leave you with this. I don't know if I convinced you that it's a good trade-off right now, but now wait. Think about what would happen if there were no costs at all in development and it worked perfectly with every modern C++ feature. Imagine that. Now, I think it becomes a no-brainer and um, it is analogous to, uh, to self-driving cars because the incremental cost of having it is zero and So here's the picture, and I just want you to think about it this way. When we had 98 and 03, we had all of these reasons not to like it. Then we had 11, and it was still not good. Then we have 17, and the scale started to tip. And then when we get this magic, there's going to be absolutely no reason not to have allocators available to use should you have the slightest desire to use them. And that's the end. Okay, thank you.